This is The Doorstep. Sponsored by the Carnegie Council for Ethics in International Affairs. Featuring Nicholas Cavosta, Tatiana Serafin, and Ash Jane. This episode was recorded on January 14th, 2021. Welcome, everyone, to this latest issue of The Doorstep. I'm Nicholas Gvozdev, a senior fellow here at the Carnegie Council for Ethics and International Affairs. And I'm Tatiana Serafin, also senior fellow at the Carnegie Council. And today we're welcoming Ash Jane, uh, who's a senior fellow with the Scrocroft Center for Strategy and Security, where he oversees the Atlantic Council's Democratic Order Initiative and D10 Strategy Forum. Uh, we spoke with Ash last fall, and we were so excited to have him on our podcast uh, this winter uh, to talk about this D10 initiative, what democracy means in the world today, um, and how that is going to be carried out by the new administration taking over next week. We have so much to talk about, right, Nick? Yes, we do. And I think that this is a, a great uh, starting point to ask uh, Ash to maybe give us an overview of how uh, the, the question of democracy, uh, both here at home in the United States and around the world, is likely to play out uh, in a Biden-Harris uh, uh, foreign policy uh, approach. Terrific. Well, uh, thank you, uh, Tatiana and Nick. Great to be with you again and look forward to today's discussion. Um, look, I, I think it's such an interesting time. Obviously, there's so much happening that is in flux here as the Biden administration begins to take office, starting no doubt with the events of the last week, uh, which have uh, had, which will have a tremendous impact uh, on the way America relates to the world and how the world perceives America uh, as Biden comes into office. Um, so if we're going to talk about democracy and how America can support democracy and work with democratic allies, we, we really have to start by taking stock of what just took place. Uh, how do we think about the impact of the, of the storming of the Capitol and the response since then, impeachment and, and these developments? Um, and and I, I think it would be worth taking some time to consider those issues even before we begin to talk about how, to, how Biden can come in and how, how to reframe and re-engage allies and partners. Absolutely. I, I think um, to, to get to some of your first points, um, you know, I've been looking at some of the uh, pictures and, and, and coverage from Der Spiegel, uh, you know, um, The Guardian in, in the UK um, and, and around the world and, and how people are viewing, seeing troops sleeping in the Capitol and, and how, you know, this is really, you know, not just what happened last week, but what is going on this week uh, and what we expect to happen, how this has really shaken. So, you know, even before, as you say, we can even move forward with policy, how this has shaken perception of the US in the world. Um, what are some of the things you're hearing? You know, I, I read this morning an editorial from the German foreign minister in Der Spiegel that this has really shaken um, democracy around the world, not just the US. Um, are leaders around the world not only worried about the US and, and our relationship, but also their own democracies. I mean, where, where do we stand today, you know, January 14th, 2021? Yeah, no, no exactly, uh, exactly right. We, um, we're in a situation where really this incident uh, of the Capitol being stormed and incited by the president of the United States, the world is aghast. Uh, they never thought something like that could happen here. Uh, they never thought that America as a kind of example of democracy around the world uh, would be facing this kind of domestic insurrection um, and that the symbols of American democracy would be under assault, not from an external enemy, uh, but from within and, and from people that are, are so angry and so agitated that they're willing to use violence uh, to advance their own beliefs. Allies, certainly I'm hearing the same thing, quite concerned uh, about what they're seeing, uh, both in terms of what it means for American leadership in the world uh, and for democracy in general. Uh, you know, the, the world wants, or at least our allies want America to succeed. They want democracy to be seen and perceived as successful uh, and the US as 
Um, many point to as the world's longest standing democracy has always been seen as a sort of um, model or, or moral example uh, that they would like to see, not necessarily that everything was working perfectly before, but that it was at least a symbol of a, of a stable and functioning democracy. And um, after, after what they're witnessing, uh, the, the kind of run up to the storming of the Capitol, the assault on democratic norms and institutions that this president, uh, President Trump has led over the past several years. They have, they've, they have been concerned uh, all the way through. Uh, but what's even more shocking uh, for our allies is to see how much support, political support, Trump continues to maintain uh, even in the face of what he's done. And, and, and that's why I think the, the impeachment proceedings and, and the follow-up, the aftermath, uh, is going to be uh, as important in shaping perceptions of America uh, as was the actual event that took place last week. Ash, if I can ask uh, to kind of build on that, uh, both with what happened on the Capitol, but also with what the outgoing administration is trying to do, and how allies and partners are reacting. I mean, I think you know, last uh, last year uh, in December, in the national interest, you laid out what you thought might be kind of the democracy, de democratic community agenda for for the Biden administration. And since you wrote that piece, obviously, uh, our European allies, particularly Germany, seem to be hedging a little bit by signing their trade uh, agreement with China. Uh, although not yet ratified, so it still gives us uh, some potential of, uh, to influence how that plays out. But of course, the outgoing administration seems to be quite interested in constraining and boxing in uh, the new administration. So do you have any sense of, of more building on this question of legacies being left, not just simply the storming of the Capitol uh, and the impeachment process, but also really uh, how much maneuvering room do you think the new administration will have to, to pursue a more uh, democracy focused agenda uh, around the world? Yeah, well, I think what we're seeing here in these kind of 11th hour policy moves um, is a desire by the Trump administration and, and by Pompeo to box in the, the new administration on particular issues that they care about, uh, whether it's on uh, re with regard to Iran or uh, some, some of the other uh, issues on Taiwan and Cuba. Uh, in, in reality, though, I think most of these policies can be easily reversed, uh, at, at least uh, over the course uh, of the early months of the Biden administration. Uh, some of them will be immediate, some others may take some time. There, there will be some review processes that will be required. Um, but I, I don't think that what Trump and the administration uh, it, are doing right now in the, in the closing days uh, are, are really going to have that significant of an impact on Biden's agenda. He, he's going to come in uh, with an opportunity to make a fresh start. Uh, there are a lot of things he can do. He can, he can begin to do right away to reinforce America's commitments uh, to alliances and, and uh, to multilateralism, uh, to showing that we're, we're back in a position uh, where America is going to be a leader, is going to be re-engaging re in international institutions, um, and is, is going to be looking for a new approach that departs sharply from the America first uh, kind of uh, overview that, that Trump brought to, into office. Biden wants to, as a, as a, person, as a person and at, as his, his own way of engaging, is to act with humility and I think you'll see that in the way he and the Biden team will uh, reflect and engage in the world, uh, a kind of humility that comes from a sense that uh, America certainly has been a, a leading force in the world, but can no longer be seen as unilateral or going it alone. Um, it's the U.S. is much better off working closely with allies and partners, uh, and that requires a sense of shared partnership and listening and engaging. And I think that it's related to the events of the last week. Our democracy has been tarnished and the, it would be uh, in keeping with Biden's kind of engagement style to come to, come to office projecting this kind of humility and humbleness uh, about what we've just faced 
um, and, and the need to rebuild and restore our own moral example here at home uh, and to rebuild our approach to the world that is, uh, that is more reflective of the America we want to be uh, as much as it might uh, be, you know, fr from the America that we have today. I think what you say is so interesting, you know, re restarting or reimagining or rebooting, I guess, the moral example here at home. And this ties into what we're trying to do at the doorstep to show the connections between our domestic life and health and our relationships around the world. Um, but I do think that, it, you know, one of the things we should look at perhaps is, is what does Biden have to deal with in terms of this populism that I think has given rise to, to a discontent um, here at home and, and you know, how he can deal with these problems, which are clearly gonna be paramount. I and mean, we haven't even touched on the pandemic and the economy, but, um, but this populism here that you know, some populist leaders in Europe are starting to distance themselves from Trump, but it always seems that people do distance themselves and then they don't. Right, uh, you, you mentioned this continued political support. Um, so do you see a death knell for populism or, or do you see it continuing to kind of tug at the edges of democracy and really unravel it a bit? Yeah, good question. Uh, Trumpism, and by that I mean this kind of American populism, populism isn't going away when Trump leaves office on January 20th. Uh, he still retains a wide body of support, the polling certainly demonstrates that. Um, he, there, there's still a lot of anger, a lot of frustration. It's amplified by what Trump has done in the past couple of months by trying to suggest that the whole system is rigged and, and uh, the whole election system is fraudulent. Um, so that's going to remain with us, the, the, the kind of agitated population that wants to see political leaders continue to make these drastic changes and uh, kind of pull at the institutions of, uh, of governance, that's going to be part of the political forces that will, will shape our domestic politics um, and will, will be something that you know, will be in the background as Biden takes, uh, takes office and, and begins to govern. Um, and it'll impact the way Congress will, will be forced to, to take into account as it begins to vote and, uh, and implement things that the Biden administration will be asking for. Uh, so I don't think it goes away, but I do think that the, what we're probably witnessing is the apex of the populist movement uh, here in the United States. Uh, Trump's election was a kind of shock to the system and the culmination of this populism that started to, that we started to see in Europe when, when the Brexit vote took place and the rise of some of the other far right extremist parties. Um, and, and then following uh, in the same time period, other populist leaders in Brazil and the Philippines and Mexico and um, places like that. So I think we're likely to see now these things ebb and flow and there's no linear kind of uh, movements uh, in, in terms of how, these th how this will play out. But it strikes me that we're starting to see the kind of populist movement, uh, you know, now on its on a kind of downward slide. It, it reached its height when they got Trump, when 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 they succeeded in getting Trump elected as president, um, and he, it'll still be a force to contend with. But it seems to me that the the trend we're on is that populism will start, will begin to dissipate and a lot will depend on what kind of policies and what kind of domestic, you know, uh, responses Biden and uh, the, and, and working with both sides of the aisle in, in Congress can do uh, to try to at least address some of the concerns that fueled populism to begin with. Uh, domestic economic grievances, um, a sense that uh, the, the country is a kind of um, beholden to, to special interests and corporations or whatever the kind of theory or in some cases conspiracy theories are. We're not going to be able to rid people of those beliefs completely, but I think there are things that can be done to show that government is more responsive to what people really care about. I think that's an interesting uh, point you raised though, Ash, because it's very clear that the Biden administration learned 
some of the lessons from the 2016 campaign about foreign policy. Uh, the, the, the Biden campaign was very clear about talking about a foreign policy uh, that serves the American middle class. We have you know, some of your uh, colleagues going into government, uh, whether you know, Jake Sullivan going in as national security advisor, but having been very interested in this question of the domestic sources of foreign policy, uh, Susan Rice, uh, you know, what people would think of as an interesting choice to head the Domestic Policy Council, but someone who might be doing those interconnections there. And then bringing this back perhaps to the, to the D10, is there a sense that uh, this D10 proposal, right, we bring together the 10 major democratic states of the world, not just simply in the West, but also in the East, uh, that this isn't just a political grouping, but it's an idea that uh, every the, the, the populations of the D10 states will see benefits from this type of association. Do you, do you see that perhaps as, as something moving forward, that this is not just going to be democracy for democracy's sake, but uh, that democracies working together uh, will in fact generate these positive outcomes and blunt the appeal of these, frankly, in some cases, and, and going back to your point about Europe, Tatiana, uh, as well as what we saw in the Capitol last week, uh, authoritarian streaks in, in these populist movements that are not committed to democracy. So that if you can show that democracy is producing these benefits, do we think that you know, we might see this uh, a, a better outcome? Yeah, well, uh, I think the first point to say, to, to make here is there is a direct connection between uh, what's happening at home and the way we conduct foreign policy. And as you said, reflecting on the idea that foreign policy needs to serve as beneficial to the middle class, American voters, uh, voters in other democracies need to see that how, that what we're doing and, and what we're investing in around the world does pose benefits for themselves. Otherwise, why, you know, why is it, why, why should the American Taxpayer, why should American people invest both uh, treasure, you know, blood and treasure, as they say, in, in terms of projecting uh, overseas if there are no benefits that accrue from that? I do think it's important that when Biden comes into office and begins to shape a new foreign policy, that they take the extra effort to make the case uh, and demonstrate clearly how America's role in the world does provide these direct benefits. And, and there are ways to make that case. Uh, having a, people like Susan Rice uh, and Jake Sullivan in these positions uh, where they've thought very deeply about this challenge. Uh, I think it's clear from their experiences and their writings, um, the way they've been talking about these issues that they very well know this is a high priority and, and so the connection between domestic and foreign policy will be kind of center of mind uh, as the administration shapes its approach, which is a good thing uh, because that is part of what's fueled this kind of populism and disillusionment uh, with, with, American, uh, with American policy. Um, so I, I think that's the, the starting point is, is really more about engaging people um, and, and doing more to bring bring the public along uh, as, we, as we demonstrate and engage uh, in the world. There's a way that the, the way, where we are today provides plenty of opportunities to do that, starting with the pandemic. Uh, the fact that we've done very little to project and engage leadership in dealing with the pandemic has been, uh, I think it's easy to see the connection to how that hurts the American public. Uh, if, there, if there's no coordination on vaccines, if there's no coordination on responses to the spread of the virus and border controls and all the other things, economic uh, reinvestment that, that have been impacted by the virus, well then that's to the detriment of the people. Um, so I think Biden can come in really with an opportunity to say we're, we're back uh, in a leadership role and the first thing we're going to do is you know, take control and work together with allies and, and through the WHO and other institutions to make sure the virus is being controlled and the vaccines are being distributed. And, and, and therefore there will be direct benefits uh, to those of us across the country that are still stuck in our houses and waiting, you know, waiting for some relief. Um, so, so, I, I, I think, so I'm optimistic that 
there will be a chance to demonstrate that connection early on. Um, that feeds into the, the question of, of how we do that and what structures do we need to make sure that's done in a visible way that demonstrates that we're back. And that's where I think the D10 format can play a particularly useful role. Uh, we, we've already seen that Boris Johnson's going to call for a G7 summit virtually uh, very early on um, in the Biden, uh, once Biden takes office. I don't know if the date's been set, but it, I think it's sometime in early February, which will be a chance from the get-go to show that the U.S. is, connect, is reconnecting uh, in a visible way with allies. Um, and the G7 exists, it's the place to start from. Uh, so it makes sense to use that format to show uh, a re-engagement, re a reaffirmation of, of the need to work with allies. Further down, I, I think there is uh, going to be some thinking about is the G7 constituted in the way it should be? Does it have the right countries at the table? Or are there others that need to be there to make this relevant for the challenges we face today? Having the fact that we only have one Asian participant in the G7, Japan, uh, is, a, is, is clearly uh, kind of demonstrating it's, it's a relic of a, a previous global order. T today's global challenges stem from Asia, China, top of mind in terms of challenge we're going to be facing and, and uh, will be, we've seen, it's been very active over the past several years uh, in various ways in terms of challenging and um, engage, uh, you know, kind of challenging democratic norms. So having a set of allies and partners at the table to talk about challenges from Asia, uh, other, other challenges to democracy, you need all of the world's major democracies to be engaged uh, if, if, if you're going to be successful. The D10 brings in Australia, brings in South Korea. Uh, it could bring in India, as the British have suggested. So having leading, you know, powerful and um, the, the most um, uh, kind of engaged dem democracies at a table where they're confronting these kinds of challenges will be important. D10 is a concept that allows for uh, the right people to be at the table. And for Biden, I think it, it really provides an opportunity to show a new, a new paradigm of leadership. It's not just reverting back to the old structures and trying to retrofit into what's already been there, but, but rather coming, coming to a, uh, bringing a new kind of uh, way of engaging and it's not just who's at the table, but it's about using the format, using this structure to address the core challenges that we all need to work together in order to solve. Whether it's uh, authoritarianism, whether it's the pandemic, uh, whether it's trade and, and global economic concerns uh, or technology. Uh, there's a wide range of issues we can get into that, but it's certainly I think the D10 is important uh, as a starting point for, for showing that there's a new format and a new kind of uh, priority being given to cooperating with democracies. Yeah, just as you were saying that, um, I was just reminded of uh, a column in uh, Nikkei Asia that uh, Parag Hanna uh, just released earlier this week talking about uh, cooperation between the EU and Japan, the US, Australia, Japan Blue Dot Network, uh, really about this kind of, as you were saying, the shift towards the Indo-Asia Pacific Basin, and that these are, you know, efforts among the democracies, uh, you know, not to be, you know, hostile to China, but really, as he puts it, uh, to accelerate these linkages, technology, supply chains without dependence on China, and really how much this depends on, uh, again, this concept of democracies working together and that in the end this will is, again this will also generate actual real concrete benefits economic benefits for for the countries involved so it, it again it looks like it's a very ambitious agenda uh, and one that aligns with what you have been writing about uh, with uh, the d10 uh, but your sense too and you talked earlier about Congress uh, you talked a bit about our domestic environment, 
do you think that we have the spirit or the vision to be able to, to grasp this opportunity and move it forward? Or are you concerned that uh, the Biden administration is going to be so consumed by fighting fires and reacting to events that uh, the ability to move on this D10 agenda uh, is going to be to be hampered, uh, regardless of what uh, you know, Boris Johnson may, may end up being more of the motive force, but you know, your sense of, uh, and since you're in Washington, your sense of your, your finger on the pulse there, you know, is this something that will excite people? Is this something that can inspire them to say this is a vision for America in the mid 21st century, or is it going to be, let's just get through the problems of this day, this week, this month, and not worry about, about the future? Yeah, that is always the challenge uh, of governance. And any new president, new leadership comes into office thinking it ha you know, has all these grand new ideas that it wants to put into being, then uh, reality kind of hits and uh, the day-to-day -day crises have to be addressed first. The attention of, of senior leadership, president on down, has to first turn to what do we do about the issue we're facing next week um, or the, late, the latest flare up, uh, whether it's at home or, or something you know, specific overseas. Um, so there is this tension between making sure that we're addressing the immediate priorities and immediate crises, even while we try to lay out a vision and a plan of action that uh, kind of projects this new, new, uh, new vision and new style of engagement. Um, so, can always, there is the risk that the, the vision could be hijacked, but I do think the Biden team has had you know, ample opportunity to think about what that kind of strategy and vision should look like. The people it's bringing into these positions, very competent, um, very, you know, um, uh, the, many of them have, have written about uh, from Kurt Campbell to, um, you know, Jake Sullivan and, and Tony Blinken and others about the, the need for America to project this kind of new leadership in the world with allies and partners. Uh, and, and so I expect that we're going to see efforts early on to try to do that. Um, and to not just, not just with photo ops, um, but, but with concrete measures that show that, that provide a way to uh, showcase a new kind of American leadership and engagement in the world. Um, so we'll have to see how it plays out. Uh, they're, they're, these things are certainly still at the early stages of being shaped when it comes to policy. The team just really is just coming together now um, and will take some time even for uh, the right people to be in place, to be Senate confirmed um, and, and for Biden to have on board who he needs to begin to implement uh, any kind of new vision. Uh, so, so, uh, so we'll see how it plays out, but I, I do think the team is well aware um, and probably inspired to take this on uh, and rise to the moment uh, when, when we, we see the need for a new kind of American moral leadership. You know, I think it's so interesting, your positivity, uh, I think is reflected, and we spoke about this in the podcast last week, in the markets, uh, which seem to be only rising globally. Uh, not just here in the U.S. Um, you know, I, so there's this sense, perhaps, you know, globally that America is back um, in a way that maybe we're not seeing in the headlines <laughs> or the pictures that are, are, are being produced. Um, and, and so, you know, that's what we hope here at the doorstep to do is to try to look more big picture and to to try to look forward to what are, what are the stories that people are maybe missing um, that that may offer kind of a path forward um, and I think you know this uh, you know you mentioned working with who and working with institutions that have been neglected uh, over the last four years um, might be you know another impetus here for the for the markets to be positive you know despite you know, news of new variants, you know, the South Africa variant of COVID, this variant, uh, new lockdowns on uh, travel. Um, and yet, you know, and I keep saying, and yet, you know, here comes the vaccine rollout, albeit slow, I agree, um, uh, and, and perhaps lack of coordination. And, uh, but, and yet, you know, here comes China, you know, trying to help. And, 
you know, maybe we do work with them in a new way. And, and so I think this is reflected a little bit in the markets that I, I don't think we should forget. Um, and a little bit too, and, and this is something I've been thinking about, you know, how it to engage young people in the foreign policy conversation. Um, and and I'm, I wonder what you think of this idea. I'm going to throw it out there because this is a big issue that I think might actually get young people involved in these discussions. You know, so uh, it's how the tech giants are dealing with free speech, you know, viscerally, the reaction has been to, of some positive to get uh, Trump and some of his supporters off Facebook, Instagram, Twitter, YouTube. Um, and of course, for others, not so great because of, you know, free speech issues, um, you know, the you know, parlor now saying it's not going to operate. But but tech and free speech and being on the internet is such a powerful issue for the younger generation. And we have world leaders really coming to the fore and saying, hey, Twitter, you shouldn't be doing that. You should maybe be more regulated. Maybe you are a private company, but you're providing a public service. Um, and so I wonder um, if, if you've looked at this issue as part of a uh, you know, one of the issues of the G10 perhaps can look at and issues of kind of engaging young people to, to be part of this domestic and foreign policy conversation to see the links uh, with the world, you know, especially if they're gonna be taken away if a Facebook decides, uh, yeah, we're not going to take content from your K-pop band in South Korea, all of a sudden, you know, or, TikTok, you're going to be banned. You know, this was the issue that really drove uh, youth uh, in the fall. And now it seems that, you know, the U.S. has said, no, you can't invest in Chinese companies. And the TikTok ban is probably going to fall apart. But might this be a way that we can try to engage the next generation of foreign policy thinkers? You know, a, a lot of people have been saying, oh, Biden has a lot of Obama leftovers. <laughs> so how can we get some young, some new thinking in? And have you thought about that, Ash, Nick? I'd love to hear what you think. Yeah, I mean, I think the idea of this whole question about social media engagement and what's uh, what should be allowed, what kinds of conversations are permissible, what goes too far. This is these are all the kinds of things you know. Gen Z has grown up with social media; it's just part of their being. So, if you want to, it's it's, a, it's probably a, a set of issues that's tailor made if you want to get. Uh, folks, uh, younger folks engaged in conversations, maybe where they uh, may not be as active um, on some other things uh, when it comes uh, when it comes to public policy. So I think this is this is a, a, a an excellent opportunity to reach out and get input from young people who probably have a, an opinion one way or the other, um, since this is what they see and use, uh, you know, on a daily and and um, uh, very frequent uh, basis. Um, it raises some some really tough questions, uh, and um, it, these are, there are no easy answers here. It's social media platforms like Twitter and Facebook and Parler. I mean, they're not obviously they're privately run and they're they're run by private companies, and so at one level they have the right to decide who to who they want to allow to engage and what kind of content they wish to permit or not permit. Um, but on the other hand, they've taken on a kind of life of their own that, that they're in some sense substituting for the public square uh, that used to be the place where opinion was expressed and uh, before you know before technology that's that's uh, you know when the constitution was written uh, and the first amendment was drafted uh, the way in which speech could be curtailed was through the was 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 by kind of suppressing people speaking out uh, in in, uh, in town squares um, or, or maybe trying to, you know, write um, in in uh, news, newspaper articles. Now we've got so many more ways of communicating and reaching people uh, immediately and and uh, and widely. And who the question is who should be in charge of deciding what content is permitted and who is permitted to engage? Um, is it you know is it Jack Dorsey and? Uh, you know, Mark Zuckerberg, I mean, are they the ones empowered to make those decisions? Um, or should it be some kind of a board or commission? Um, what's the role of government? And, and uh, I, I think these require a lot more uh, study and, and, and a lot more analysis uh, and some 
kind of the most important thing in my view, this actually relates to our conversation earlier is that these decisions shouldn't be made in a vacuum and shouldn't be made individually. It, it doesn't serve anybody's interest if Facebook has one policy and Twitter has another, and then uh, you know Europe, uh, European regulators, you know, uh, have have one set of uh, uh, kind of rules for uh, hate speech, and it's different in India and you know Canada, and I mean it just it just a, it, these are all globally linked, and so they require some coordination and uniformity to be effective. That's where I do think, whether it's the D10 or some other way uh, of some other structure, there needs to be discussions about technology norms and social media norms that are not just ma being made individually by countries, but rather among democracies who all should come at this from this kind of shared starting point that we wanna protect free speech, we wanna protect the ability for people to engage uh, but we also don't want to give uh, latitude for people to promote and incite violence. Um, and then there are all the gray areas. So if you're not inciting violence, but you're expressing, you know, views that are unpopular or filled with kind of hateful rhetoric, should that be allowed or not? Uh, I, my conversations with younger people, um, including my, my own son who's starting college uh, this year, you know, they, there's less tolerance for that kind of the idea that you should be able to express, um, you know, hate, hate speech, that, that, that's not, so there, there's just, I think, tough issues to un untangle here. How, how far should we be going in preventing or deterring people from expressing views that we find uncomfortable? I, I really like your idea of, um, of a multilateral approach to discussing these issues. I think that we need to do more of that. I'm very much looking forward to how the new administration does re-engage with the world. Um, I, I think this has been an excellent discussion and, and we have so much to look forward to in the next few weeks, so much change coming. Um, thank you so much for joining us today, uh, Ash. Uh, I really appreciate your time um, and your ideas. Well, no, thank you for having me. This has been a great conversation and I hope we get a chance to, uh, re to continue these, uh, these kinds of conversations in the future. Thanks for listening to The Doorstep, sponsored by the Carnegie Council for Ethics and International Affairs. For more, go to carnegiecouncil.org. Stay healthy and safe.